Okay, well, let, let, let's begin. People will probably join us uh, still in the few minutes. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this online seminar of the Illiberalism Studies Program at the George Washington University. My name is Marlene Larel. I'm the director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at GW, and I'm also uh, leading the Illiberalism Studies Program. And I'm really, really happy today to receive two uh, of my uh, colleagues who will be discussing what is probably one of the most important topics related to uh, illiberalism in Europe now, which is the, the tense situation in <laughs> Poland, Hungary, and the relationship uh, um, uh, uh, to Europe. And I really like the title, right? How to undo illiberalism. I think that's a big question, not only for, for, for Europe, but it is in particularly uh, for Europe, because you have a, a supranational construction that partly feel endangered by what is happening now in, in Poland and, and, and Hungary. So let me briefly uh, present our two uh, speakers. They have just uh, uh, jointly published a book that I really recommend to you, Liberal Constitutionalisms in Poland and Hungary, The Deterioration of Democracy, Misuse of Human Rights and Abuse of rule, rule of Law, that was published a few months ago at at Routledge, and it's really a great book, and that's how we kind of get in touch and decided to have this broader discussion on, on the Poland, Hungary, and the, the future of Europe. So we have with us uh, uh, Agnieszka Bienkatsawa, uh, who is Associate Professor of Constitutional Law at the Faculty of Law and Administration at the uh, uh, Copernicus University in Torun in Poland. And we have uh, Timea uh, Drino, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble with the, some names sometimes, Dimea Drinozzi, who is visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at the Fener Federal University of Minas in Brazil, but she has been uh, working in several different places uh, in the world. And so both Agnieszka and Timea have been working together on that book, as I was telling you, and really looking at uh, what is happening in terms of illiberalism and law and constitution and rule of law in uh, Poland and Hungary. And we will be today discussing how much it is impacting uh, Europe and what can be the solution to undo uh, uh, liberalism. So I will give them the floor for a presentation. And then I invite everybody after to either use the chat to ask questions, but as we are a small group, we can also take the floor. It makes things nicer for, for the discussion. So you can raise your virtual end when we will be opening the Q&A session and we, can, uh, we will give you the floor to, to ask your question. So Agnieszka Timea, uh, welcome uh, once again and I give you the floor. Uh, yes, thank you uh, very much. We decided that I will start uh, our uh, speech and I would, I would like to start with saying thank you, Marlene, for the uh, invitation and for the organization of the seminar. Uh, we are really uh, happy to be here and uh, uh, have this uh, discussion. Uh, so today, uh, as uh, Marlene introduced, uh, we would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, our future research plan um, uh, that concerned the topic, uh, how to undo illiberalism. Uh, so if we want to, uh, consider how to undo illiberalism, uh, first we uh, need to know what it is. And in our book uh, uh, on the topic uh, titled Liberal Constitutionalism in Poland and Hungary, um, uh, we discussed uh, this issue from a constitutional law perspective. And reflecting on the regional context, gradualness, methods, and content of changes, and tangible differences between Hungary and Poland and real authoritarian states, and taking a holistic uh, view on uh, different indices, we have developed this concept of illiberal constitutionalism. And in our view, it is a stage in the authoritarianization uh, process of uh, EU member states, mainly in the post-socialist uh, region that uh, has been hit uh, by autocrat populist leaders in the second decade of 21st uh, century. They have brought about the deterioration of the constitutional democracy and the hollowing out of its components 
forming the constitutive features of illiberal constitutionalism that are uh, illiberal legality, uh, illiberal democracy, and illiberalization of human rights. Uh, illiberal, in the term illiberal constitutionalism, neither refers directly to the polity itself, like in Theo's work, nor entails a coherent political uh, philosophy, despite uh, some attempts uh, in work of uh, pro-government uh, scholars, uh, for example, that those scholars developed the idea of political constitutionalism. Uh, instead, we will uh, we, uh, see uh, this idea as a patchwork of uh, some uh, ideologies, for example, nationalism, and some components of uh, political philosophy, uh, like communitarianism, conservatism, uh, political realism and pragmatism, or neoliberalism. Uh, all of them have, uh, are heavily uh, influenced and determined by right-wing uh, populism and identity politics. Uh, the adaptive ground for these, as we see it, uh, is uh, the unbalanced constitutional identity of Poles and Hungarians. Uh, we base this view on our history, the emotional trajectory revealed by studies of narrative psycho psychology and research on the values and value orientations of people from CEE region compared to the Western European uh, states. Uh, Poles and Hungarians exhibit an illiberal value orientation. Uh, historically, we desire to reach genuine independence and uh, sovereignty. Uh, therefore, we are more receptive to an authoritarian leader, paternalism, clientelism, nationalism, and we are also more permissive uh, with uh, corruption. Uh, historically, the coincidence of a uh, historical moment of unbalanced uh, identity and the emergence of an illiberal and charismatic leader has shown more durability in Hungary and Poland than the liberal constitutional uh, period, especially after the transition in the 90s. It might be assumed that uh, there is a historically held belief and uh, applied practice that these countries are better run if there is a charismatic leader whose charisma is more important than their uh, ideology uh, due to the unbalanced constitutional uh, identity. It would require obviously further study to establish if this uh, could create a basis for a distinct ideology or a more coherent political philosophy for illiberalism itself. We did not uh, and would not uh, want to go in this direction. What we propose in the book is that uh, at this moment in time, illiberal constitutionalism is a reality that seems to be attractive for Poland and Hungarians. And here is uh, when we decided that uh, Tima will continue. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm also grateful to Marlene for inviting us to this webinar. Thank you very much. And now uh, Agnieszka um, uh, finished um, this part that uh, there is a kind of uh, attractiveness in the system. And so let me just quickly talk about it a little bit. Uh, what is important to understand is that Hungarian and Polish uh, illiberal project works and endures, as we can see, as it uh, needs a population that supports or at least accepts it, but for sure does not actively and forcefully oppose it, or where and when they do oppose it, they fail to exert changes. Think about uh, Poland and the case of abortion and judicial independence, and Hungary in the case of, for instance, the Central European University. So they were protests, but nothing actually uh, was like achieved by the protesters. Voters, as we know, gave Fidesz supermajority in uh, 2010 based on the previously existing electoral rules and media regulations. In 2014, uh, we then already changed electoral system, which despite its flaws was not considered fraudulent 
and they also received super majority in uh, 2018. Uh, the monopolization of the media also occurred gradually, and for a short period of time, Fidesz lost its super majority as a result of some by election, but they regained it. In Poland, Kaczynski did not gain a, sub, a constitutional majority in 15 and 19, but a simple majority is enough to govern and remove that the system with the help of the fact constitutional tribunal, uh, as we know. <laughs> the Polish and the Hungarian governments mix economic incentives and reliance on emotions, desires, and fears. So voters re-elected Fidesz and Peace, even if they knew that independent institutions including the constitutional courts had been attacked, which was followed by the attacks against, for instance, free media, NGOs, migrants, and the independence of ordinary court system and the encroachment against uh, universities and research institutions. Especially in Hungary, public money and institutions have become private. In both states, reforms are rather victims. A significant parts of the population are not treated as persons with equal dignity, and yet, Voters still support the system, no matter what, including how Orban handled the pandemic and the vaccination or how peace has used the pandemic for its own purposes. And according to the latest polls November, this November, Fidesz is firmly, equally or a little bit more supported than the united opposition. In Poland, the opposition is not united and peace supporters count around 30%, which translates to a simple majority in the same. And uh, what is uh, important here for us is to see that the situation in Hungary is now more important for monitoring as there will be general elections soon. And observing Hungary, as usually, uh, might help understand the situation in Poland in 2023 and the general election will take place there. So it seems that first, undoing the system goes beyond legal studies. Second, it is a uh, uh, there is a concern that opposition parties, when they get into power, will not offer, will not only offer, but introduce illiberal remedies for illiberal measures, and their voters will accept, tolerate, and support it. If any of it happens, it would be detrimental to the ideal of constitutional democracy and the EU, because illiberalism has a contagious nature, and it can be learned how to push the envelope vis-a-vis -vis the EU. We just need to recall the most recent example from Romania on the independence of the judiciary and the constitutional court's attitude towards the primacy of EU law, which resembles very much to the Polish ruling. And so now Agnieszka will continue. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Tina, uh, again. So therefore, uh, in our new project, because we are uh, here to discuss uh, our new project and uh, plans, future plans for uh, for research. Uh, uh, so we would like to see what actual uh, possibilities there are to retransform illiberal constitutionalism back to substantive constitutional democracy. Uh, what to do with this uh, unbalanced constitutional uh, identity and investigate how not to undo illiberalism. Uh, in, uh, to, today, we would like to give you three points. Uh, uh, first and second will be addressed by me and the third by uh, Tima. So the first is that uh, public law mechanism that could not prevent a liberal turn are not helpful in restoring liberal constitutionalism. Uh, it might be true for European measures, uh, domestic political events, and other possible efforts uh, for undoing illiberal constitutionalism. Uh, so we need to follow up uh, on what will happen in these uh, fields in the coming months, uh, find other mechanisms to address uh, future illiberal practices and stop an emerging new ones. And we need to understand better why illiberalism received the support of Hungarians and Poles and need to address uh, this value orientation and identity, national identity related phenomenon. 
Our second point is uh, that, as we know, uh, the legal term of constitutional identity uh, has been used as an excuse to deny the primacy of the EU law by both the Polish and Hungarian constitutional courts. If we talk about uh, to, uh, how to undo illiberal constitutionalism, one of the most uh, critical issues uh, is uh, connected with the powers and membership of the constitutional courts. Although Poles and Hungarians are still supporting the EU, political communications, uh, institutional reforms, and legal actions of uh, political and uh, judicial uh, branches uh, and uh, electoral victories of the populist uh, autocrats tell a different uh, story and prove a different aspiration and narrative. Uh, the term constitutional identity of Hungary was uh, invented by the Hungarian Constitutional Court in 2016. Uh, which uh, declared that it is, uh, its protection is the obligation of uh, all. Uh, this decision was quickly uh, followed by the formal uh, constitu constitutionalization of the term. Uh, as you know, uh, in October of uh, this year, 2021, in Poland, the Constitutional Tribunal declared some provisions of the EU treaty unconstitutional, which was loudly welcomed and supported by the Hungarian government. Uh, these events indicate a possibility or even necessity of leaving the EU in some way or being blocked within the EU. Uh, also, we can see a need uh, for reconsideration of what the EU is and in which direction it, it intends to go with these uh, illiberal member states. This latter case will be uh, a challenge to the EU, mainly when more and more courts would follow suit in uh, revoking their uh, constitutional identity or national sovereignty against the EU law. And if uh, Fidesz and uh, Peace win the next elections, uh, they will most probably continue their consolidation efforts by using the usual tactics and methods, but most importantly, they will continue uh, the reference to constitutional identity as an excuse to refusing uh, the implementation of the European law. If it happens, we might be experiencing clashes of the constitutional identities in the European arena. It would be a challenge to the European constitutional identity and the common constitutional traditions of the member states, as we have understood it before the emergence of illiberalism. And here again, a third point will be addressed by Tina. So, Tina, please. Yes, thanks. So this uh, third point is uh, connected to the unbalanced national identity of Hungarians and Poles, as it is not fit for accommodating the values of liberal constitutionalism for the long run, as we experience it, but it does not entirely reject these uh, values. Uh, moreover, the population is mostly supported towards the EU membership, as we mentioned. They, however, at the same time, still support Fidesz and peace. Nevertheless, it is also true that uh, in the last couple of months, the united opposition in Hungary has been able to attract more and more supporters, which fact gave, which fact gave rise to the hope of retransforming uh, the system. And I guess that this is why we are talking about it right now. They have been, the united opposition, they have been talking about withdrawing the constitution and adopting a new one with a simple majority. I mean, even with a simple majority, they are talking about cancelling the constitutional court and absorbing its powers by the newly elected parliament, making political and other public figures responsible for their actions, regardless of the fact that these actions might have been based on the actual law in effect. It has already been said that for getting rid of Orban's regime, a little bit of disregard of the rule of law could be acceptable. This approach and attitude would challenge not only the idea that the proponents of constitutional democracy are the 
friends of the rule of law, but would challenge the EU, its member states, and scholars as well. Is there a difference between the rule of law infringements based on our morals and political views? Is there any power for justification for this in illiberal constitutionalism and in the light of the historical transitions from authoritarian regimes? If there are, what are these? Something needs to be done for sure. So we are not saying that it's impossible, uh, but uh, what we uh, are saying, I think, is that we should do this something without compromising our values and principles. That would be very difficult, most probably. Uh, but now turning back to Poland a little bit, and there too have been discussions about withdrawing the mandate of some members of the Constitutional Tribunal and empowering ordinary courts to make constitutional, including EU law review, for which, however, the Constitution does not authorize them, the ordinary courts. It is hoped there in Poland that in this way, the illiberal invisible Polish constitution, which have been created by the tribunal and the, the government and, and uh, the same. Uh, so this invisible and illiberal Polish constitution could be changed through an adequate interpretation of the constitution 1997 by ordinary courts. Nevertheless, as said, the way of the retransformation or undoing in both countries at this point of time seems to be, unfortunately, questionable from the perspective of the rule of law and democracy. And it right now, to a certain extent, also seems to be more illiberal than not. And let us just note here, the uh, next elections in Hungary are very close we have not seen any coherent program from the United Opposition yet as to how actually they plan to undo illiberalism. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Anishka and, and Timia for the, this great presentation. I see a lot of uh, um, elements where the direction, direction the, the, the discussion could go. I, I'm, I'm really interested in your idea that we need to look more at what are the, the values and the, the kind of the, the grassroots demand for liberalism. We always tend, I mean, the literature is mostly looking at the, <laughs> the supplying side, right? What are the charismatic leaders and party wants, but you have people at the grassroots level who accept that and, and, and uh, uh, claim it. And I think that's a new direction for the literature to look at this kind of grassroots needs to see how because that's where we will have to work if we want to undo <laughs> something that will have, have to go down from the leader and the parties and the institution to the to the uh, uh, individuals and then this idea that yeah constitution and, and values will have to also adapt to what are the kind of the sociological and cultural realities of every society i mean it's a big lesson and a big issues for the eu where we tend to be very normative and wanted things to be uh, uh, unified. So, so I, I welcome a, a question. I have several uh, questions uh, myself, but I would uh, like the, the room to, to get engaged. You can ask your question in the chat or you can just raise your uh, uh, virtual hand and we will give you the floor. So don't uh, um, hesitate. So I see a first question uh, uh, coming. Could we hear a little uh, about Poland and Hungary individually in terms of their relationship to Russia? Is that a risk that moving away from the EU means moving toward Russia? Yeah, that's where the, the kind of foreign policy and domestic policy <laughs> issues are articulating. Anishka or Timia, who would like to take that uh, issue? Uh, I can start if uh, Timia agree. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, so as for Poland, it is not so, so we, uh, here it, we see the difference uh, uh, in the attitudes of uh, a Polish government and uh, and Hungarian uh, one. So in Poland, we uh, do not accept anything which is connected with the, uh, how to say, good attitude towards Russia and Russians. Uh, but uh, in fact, it is uh, indirectly uh, like we did something against the EU that 
automatically make us closer to uh, to Russia. And but I think that uh, it is uh, um, not possible uh, in the communication uh, to talk about uh, something that uh, could or some events that could uh, be done together with uh, Russia or with uh, Putin. It is because obviously because of our history, uh, not only the uh, Soviet period, but also the partitions. Uh, you have to remember that part of Poland uh, um, uh, was uh, included in the in, in Russian Imperium, so uh, it is not uh, uh, not like that that we are uh, have this friendly attitude towards uh, Russia. Yeah, this is what uh, is the most important. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I would uh, like to uh, a little bit answer from a different perspective, maybe. So first, the, um, we, we have been experiencing moving away from the EU and moving towards Putin in terms of like borrowing certain um, legal measures from, from the, their legal system. So how we, we deal with uh, the NGOs, for instance. And, uh, and the uh, LGBTQ community. Uh, so in, in, in the legal sphere, uh, it is like, yes, moving towards it is an ongoing process. Uh, what I would like to say rather is that from a historical perspective, Hungary always considered itself as a, as a, as a, as a state in between, in between the West and the East. And once we, we wanted to go to the West, then we, we, um, we did things, we I draw uh, the, um, the um, links with them. And then because of other historical circles, so we was uh, draw back from, from the West to the East uh, during the socialism, and then we went back to the West. And then now the argument, the political argument, as you say, is that, uh, uh, we want to, politically speaking, we still want to be the member states of the European Union, but there are a uh, life outside of the European Union as well. So it is again this uh, way in between the West and the East. And so historically, if we are like uh, um, moving away from the West, obviously we are approaching to the East and, and East doesn't necessarily only mean like Russia, but China as well. Just consider our idea of inviting uh, the the, univer the university, the Putin University, and creating uh, that uh, campus in Budapest and taking away the original plan for for making campus for Hungarian students. So you know this uh, this uh, uh, story with that. Uh, so um, I wouldn't uh, really, for, I mean, yeah, from an international relations perspective. Uh, it is important to, to focus on like Putin and Russia, but from, from our perspective, from, from the historical perspective, it may be it's more important to understand this balancing, always, all the time, balancing between uh, East and West. And, and then we want to, to think that we always wanted to, to belong to the West. And then the transition uh, in the 90s, we were like happy that we arrived. And we just lost that enthusiasm, or I don't know, because now we support the political system, which is apparently doesn't really want to belong. It wants to, but not. So playing. Yeah. Thank you. We have another could question I, from our. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anisha, sorry, sorry, could I? I would like to add something because for as for um, also Polish attitudes uh, and what is the role of the European Union. Uh, it is also expressed this uh, opinion that uh, uh, we oppose our government, yes, peace uh, uh, opposed to the European Union uh, because EU uh, is doing something above the Polish head and uh, this connection between EU or Germany and Russia are dangerous for us. Yes, this is uh, the communication. So I don't think that we are, uh, uh, yes, directly, as I said, closer to, to, to this direction. We oppose both, yes, but yes, in fact, as Tima uh, said, it is the value orientation is uh, like, like it is, yes. So thank you, sorry. 
No, no, that's great. Thank you so much. We have another question from our colleague Elenka Bustikova asking you if you please, pl could please comment on the cooperation between the four uh, Visegrad uh, countries as nativist populist lost power both in Czech Republic and in Slovakia and both current and future governments in uh, both countries are becoming reluctant about supporting the peace and supporting uh, uh, Orban. So what Thank about you. this kind of regional cooperation aspect? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very important question. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And I think that here here um, we have to realize the differences of our approaches, and that is why we have like different. I mean, we are constitutional lawyers, and for us, it it is interesting. Yes, how leaders are supporting, not supporting politically uh, other leaders. But what is more important is that. Uh, what they are actually doing with that legal system. So what type of uh, decisions are um, coming from the constitutional court, uh, how they reform their system, why they do that, into which direction they are going with that, whether it resembles to the Hungarian or Polish approach. And, and uh, let me just uh, go a little bit beyond uh, the, the question. Uh, in Romania, they are doing the same, legally speaking, as, as, as in Poland with uh, the constitutional cause decision about uh, uh, what to do with the EU law and the clash with uh, the, uh, the constitutional constitutional considerations. So uh, I understand that from political perspective, it's, it's, a, it's an, a very important question, but uh, um, I, as a constitutional lawyer, I, I couldn't really uh, answer that. My answer for that is let us look what is going on uh, in the legal field, because that would inform us about uh, the actual transformation of the actual system. Because if you remember, um, uh, Romania is now like, uh, they are started writing about Romanian constitutional court, but just one year ago, a little bit more than one year ago, we had a really nice webinar about uh, uh, neo-militant neo democracies in the Central and Eastern European states. And then one of the, uh, participants uh, from Romania was talking about the very fact that it is fascinating that in Romania very similar pro uh, uh, processes have been um, uh, occurring and, and the EU doesn't really uh, do anything uh, about that. So let us just look at what is, is going on because I mean it for us it's more important. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question about the role of uh, public diplomacy in terms of countering the rise of illiberalism by, by opposition party. But I would also make it broader and ask you how public diplomacy has been also used as a tool by Poland and Hungary to try to promote illiberal uh, uh, values and, and a liberal legal system in, uh, in the EU. So if you could address that uh, aspect of relations with, with uh, of illiberal constitutionalism and the, the, the public diplomacy aspect would be great also. So, okay, <laughs> I can start, but um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the perspective that this is, it is not uh, included in the constitutional uh, law, which uh, is my subject, but I will try to, uh, to say something uh, substantial, um, I think that um, yes, this uh, what is uh, in fact uh, that it, our uh, illiberal uh, attitudes or some elements of uh, constitutional systems are promoted, uh, but as liberal one, uh, the the understanding of uh, the rule of law is uh, said to be the real one. Uh, so what we are doing, like Hungary and Poland, is what it is in reality, the rule of law, democracy, and, uh, and human rights protections. And this is a, a common uh, uh, here com communication in Poland that, uh, yes, the European Union does not know what it is, and we have we know better what is the sovereignty, uh, uh, how to address those uh, um, elements uh, when you are a part of uh, 
uh, supranational uh, community. Uh, so this is how I would say like uh, pretense that we are doing good, but in fact we are promoting yes as it is uh, uh, illiberal uh, elements and behaviors. Yes, I would stop here and maybe <laughs> Tima has uh, more insights uh, on that. Yes, so yes, exactly. But then uh, we have to also uh, think about that uh, uh, the composition of the European Parliament, and obviously there are uh, uh, members from the opposition parties, and and we can recall the reports made by the certain uh, committees of the European Parliament about uh, about Hungary, and so there are efforts. But then it is not that. This is not about uh, whether they did enough or whether they could uh, do enough, but is it is about what the EU as an organization can do or could have done. And I don't believe that they could have done anything better if they had better knowledge uh, about the situation from the opposition parties, because um, you realize what is being done when it is on a, um, almost like finished, unfortunately, so you not, not necessarily realize uh, the actual process uh, when it is done for the first time. Now, if any other st state starts to do uh, what uh, uh, whatever they are doing, for instance, the judiciary, then you, you, now you know that, okay, that is dangerous thing. But maybe in the very beginning, it was like not as evident. And what was not really evident, I think, is that that they don't want to listen. I mean, uh, these um, uh, Hungarian and Polish leaders, they just simply don't want to listen what the European Union is telling to them. Because as Agnieszka said, we know it better and we have really powerful arguments uh, because um, we, we, could, we could use uh, um, the, uh, the weaknesses of this kind of uh, public diplomacy because obviously there are like, the talks are like at political level maybe, and then, then, then um, a visiting committee is coming to Hungary. Obviously, everything depends on to, with whom they are meeting and how they understand what has been uh, said, what they ask, whether they actually understand within a visit, a couple of days, what is actually being done in Hungary. Uh, so there are many, uh, many issues here. So um, I think that, okay, it has been used, but, it, 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 it is not an efficient uh, tool. And why it is not? Because these, these two parties, they do not speak the same language and that is it. And this is what the EU and others uh, haven't realized in time. And now, uh, now I think that they started to realize it when, because it is just recently when they started to link the rule of law issues to, to money. <laughs> And, but we don't know whether it would be efficient, but we see a process that let us just dialogue because that is the normal way of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. Let us dialogue. Dialogue is not okay. It's not enough. Let us do something else. Yeah, so sorry for being so long. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's great. And if I can, in a sense, uh, uh, follow up on that with the question about uh, you know, the policy making of the law, I mean, what do we know for both Poland and Hungary about who are the groups, the lobbyists, the think tanks, how is that created? I mean, do, how do you create a liberal, uh, you, you change the legislation to make it more liberal? Can we identify it clearly? Because we tend to always say like, you know, it's Orban or the peace, so it's it's we use the kind of broad term of the executive power, but very often concretely you can identify groups that can be fighting with each other, that can have their own financial business related interests, that can have some transnational connection. So can we identify some of this lobby or, or kind of group of thinkers, lawyers, doers who are trying to, to work in the back and, and change the legislation? I, I would say that first in Hungary, we don't have, uh, I, I understand what you are asking. Uh, in Hungary, we don't have policymaking process, like a, as a genuine policymaking process. We have a directive. I want to increase the punishment for this crime 
I don't know. And why? Just because. Because now it seems to be beneficial politically. And then those people who are working in the ministries trying to draft the actual criminal law provision, they are just like, oh my God, how can I do that? Because if I increase that, it would uh, bring unbalance in the, in the system of punishment and the criminal justice, and it will not be, be good. But they have to do that because they are ordered to do that. And so it, it, is, it is a very important and interesting, interesting question. But I'm sorry, but it simply makes no sense in the Hungarian context. Because um, there, is no, this, there might be like lobby, yes, but not in the sense as you have in, in the US. Because those, those national, um, 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 we have oligarchs, I mean, and this is it. And they are created by the system. So why would they lobby for what? Yeah, what is important is uh, how, uh, I, how um, these um, um, foreign uh, investments are dealt with. Uh, so the, the uh, like car companies in Hungary who has uh, that type of uh, economic interest in Hungary, which EU member state has that interest. Uh, so that is uh, uh, more important. How they lobby, whether they lobby. Yeah, this is, I mean, I don't have knowledge on that, but most probably there is something, but not nationally because, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I was thinking in asking the question, I was not thinking about, about the US, I was thinking about Russia where in fact we can identify group of pressure you know at the, the the national parliament the duma and we so we have the readings of the duma we can see which group is pushing for example to make the law tougher on this or that aspect and then you have kind of i mean of course the information can come from the presidential administration and the kind of collective vladimir putin that exists but we can also still identify some group fighting with each other so that's interesting that depending on the country, we we can or cannot identify these kind of groups. Yes. This is this might be because uh, now in the in the parliament uh, we don't have these groups because of the super majority, so the two third majority there. So and we have parliamentary governmental system. Yeah, yeah. not like presidential. So and yeah. this is also because everything is like supposedly are done by, I mean, the preparation of laws are, are, are done uh, at the governmental level, so pre-parliamentary stage. And we have an occupied parliament by, by the government. Uh, yeah. but, uh, Anushka, yes. would you like to yeah. comment on the Polish case? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, because uh, in Poland, I see uh, at least one group, uh, uh, one organization that it is uh, connected uh, I wouldn't say that it is connected with Catholic Church, but the Catholic uh, views, opinions. It is uh, the group, it is uh, called Ordo Iuris, and they are responsible, uh, among others, for an uh, abortion case. They push the case, yes, to, to um, uh, the Constitutional Tribunal. Obviously, it was uh, activated by, by one of the MPs or the group of MPs, um, but people in Poland cannot uh, launch this uh, cases uh, before constitutional tribunal. So this is why it was uh, this direction. And now this is very dangerous because one of uh, uh, activists connected with this Ordo Iuris, uh, Kaya Godek, uh, it is a lady uh, who uh, is uh, promoting the uh, uh, new law on assemblies that exclude uh, LGBTQI people, and it is directly uh, uh, pushed against them. Uh, so I would say that I can identify in Poland uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, yes, environment or, or groups or, or organization, but they are connected with uh, special values, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that would, in that case, the, the parallel with Russia would also work where we know, for example, exactly when the Russian Orthodox Church is lobbying at the parliament, for example, to restrict the law on abortions. So we can identify the actors sometime and, and sometime we, we cannot. And that brings me to a question we have from our 
a colleague, uh, John, asking how strong is the illiberal civil societies in these two countries and what obstacle do they create for the prospect of undoing illiberalism? So we are going back to this key question about the grassroots. What, what about the societies and the values shared by the societies and, and, and how we can, I mean, undoing the values is much more difficult than undoing <laughs> uh, 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 institutional changes. So I give you the floor back on that key question. Thank you. Uh, civil society, I mean, it's, um, it's not, not really strong in Hungary. So as a main rule. And uh, obviously we have, but um, uh, that, that you, you need to know this. And then we have, uh, it's interesting, like a liberal civil society. And uh, so we have this, uh, I looked it up, but I, 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 I never looked it up, uh, what the, the English name of this uh, organization, which, which is like Peace March, or I don't know. So they, they organize this like demonstrations and events, and they actively support the, the politics of the government. And, uh, and I guess that they have their own uh, own groups that are more civil society uh, organizations belong to a bigger group and they organize this speech, uh, these uh, peace marches when it's uh, necessary, just supporting what, whatever the government is saying. Uh, I'm not sure that it is actually a genuine civil society, so that should be researched. And, uh, um, and what obstacles do they create? Um, I mean, I don't know, because um, it is, um, it is, I don't think that, that uh, like undoing or doing illiberal constitutionalism, uh, it is not coming from, from the civil society at all. It is not like uh, bottom up, it, everything has been done like top down. And even though we were like talking about the people and the level of the society, we meant the actual individual value orientation of, of, of the people. And uh, uh, in, what you also need to, 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 to see here, but probably you know that uh, these, these two groups like uh, pro and anti-government or illiberal or liberal civil society of people, they believe actually, they believe in things. They believe in the leader and, uh, and so, it, there is a, they don't they don't need to do anything to to, to create or obstacle because uh, the government creates obstacle for them. Just remember the um, the act on N NGOs. So, Anishka, yeah, if I could add something that. Uh, it is also crucial to, to know or to imagine how, uh, how supporters or, or pro-government or anti-government uh, groups are, uh, um, are thinking. Uh, if we think about opposition, uh, so anti-government uh, people or civil, part of civil society, we need to know that they also have this uh, illiberal uh, value in, in them, because they also want to have an autocratic leader, but not that one who is uh, actual, actually govern, governing, yes? So this is a tricky uh, question, and I am not sure if we can uh, 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 talk, as Tima said, can talk about uh, non-liberal and liberal civil society. Yes, this is, uh, we have to consider the value orientation of people. So we don't want this uh, autocratic leader, but we want uh, another one. Yes, thank you. It just came to my mind that maybe we can mention the Gongs as well, uh, because they are working on, on like uh, actually uh, giving a theoretical foundation of, of, of the government policies. We have a center for fundamental rights and uh, created by the government. And uh, they pretend to be like independent researchers and, and um, working on the field of, uh, of fundamental rights. But if I can remember and recall well, uh, that um, the representative of that center uh, was on the opinion uh, that it is okay if 
we just give uh, fundamental rights to the state. Okay, so, so according to them, it's okay if we theoretically accept the possibility that the state has a fundamental right, even though fundamental rights were like invented against the power, which is the state at that time. So uh, it is also very interesting. So the theoretical foundation and uh, uh, which would like make us very, uh, make it very difficult, which would make it very difficult to undo the system because once you have a nice theory, then I mean, everybody is like, okay, there are people saying that it's okay, it's fine. So let me just believe because I don't know. Uh, that is dangerous. And what is dangerous as well, it's not really civil society, but uh, about the people. So uh, education is very important and now everything is like privatized in Hungary. And, and there is a fear that uh, in a midterm and long term, uh, all the professors who would be responsible for PhD studies and PhD students, they would uh, belong to, to this type of uh, illiberal uh, ideology. And so they would like, they will talk about uh, autonomy of higher education, but they will understand it like the autonomy of the, the foundation, the, the fund which is at the top of the university. This, is it autonomy? Yes, it is a kind of autonomy. Is it logical to talk? Yes, it is. But it's like illiberal. So they, they would like set the tone for further research. They, they would like educate and, and um, train the new scholars uh, according to their ideas. And you don't need to like think it, it like uh, there are like actual directives. I don't believe that anybody from the government said them that you have to do this. No, it is like, like, yeah, now I know what is expected from me to do. Why? Because it was done in, during the socialism as well. So, and, and we, we, we return back to the value orientation and how we perceive uh, liberty or responsibility or uh, um, the uh, authority uh, hierarchy. So, that is, is and, and that one is very, very dangerous because now how we can redo everything. If we, are, if we cannot do right now, start the reestablishing uh, constitutional democracy. Uh, I, I think that in Hungary, given this privatization of universities, uh, it will be much uh, more difficult to undo because you have to undo everything and you have to change the mindset. Of, of the scholars and yeah, this is uh, what we, we see unfortunately very the future as a very dark place for us. <laughs> if I can follow up on, on that, not on the, 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 the pessimistic pessimism, but on the, the, <laughs> the value oriented. So how would you articulate? So you have conservative values in societies that may emerge in relation to the definition of family or the definition of the nation. And that is acceptable value. That's value shared by a large part of the population in some European countries. Here in the US, it's half of the population. So that is a kind of classic conservatism in terms of, of values. But then illiberalism is another aspect, right? Why you have a transformation of the state and the political power in a sense where you don't want any more kind of alternance of so-called liberal and so-called conservative in terms of values. And, and all that is geopoliticized uh, against the EU. So the EU as a symbol of liberal values against a society's embodying conservative values. So how do you think the EU can try to undo illiberalism while recognizing that you may have conservative consist consistency constituency sorry a, a group social group constituencies in terms of, of values right i think there there is a tension in what we define as liberal is that in terms of values is that in terms of politics and and that has been used and weaponized by liberal regime against the eu by associating political liberalism with kind of cultural or moral liberalism. And of course, all the, the weaponization of the LGBTQ is, is of course a, a big issue. So if you could address that uh, rapidly in the few minutes we, we still have. Uh, oh, okay, so uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, this is uh, entirely like conservative. They said to be, but I'm, I'm not convinced. 
uh, obvious, and I think that illiberal, but you, you wrote about that, that what illiberalism is. So we need to actually uh, do more research about that because I don't think that uh, it equals with conservatism. And there are conservative people, of course, but uh, they don't necessarily are uh, illiberal. So for instance, this, uh, um, the person who was like elected in this uh, kind of primary, in Hungary as a candidate for prime minister. Uh, he is a, a, a I mean, the side declaration or identification, he identifies himself as a conservative person and still he goes against uh, Orban. So I, I, I think that illiberalism is something different. It is like, uh, um, it, as, as for the values, it is like not really this uh, political philosophy because as we stated in, in the book, we don't think that there is a, um, a core and political philosophy behind uh, these systems, but like patchworks and and they use what they they need to to use to to maintain the power and they abuse this tendency of the people to to not to take responsibility for their lives because we want uh, we want liberty we want freedom but we don't want the responsibility part for that we want that the state take care of us. Right, and once we we accept the fact that we cannot um, be like responsible persons for our own lives, and we accept that somebody needs to take care of us, now it is like uh, it is it is it is something else, and they abuse they abuse this, and they give they give they give emotionally, financially, emotionally, they give the people. And and then then the polls as a, as a, the leader as the messiah who would uh, uh, protect us and lead us to the kind I don't know uh, because they know it better and we believe it that they know it better than us why because we believe in in the authority we believe in hierarchy we have this this way of thinking. So we, we, we don't, I mean, it is like stereotypically true, okay? So I'm not saying that everybody is like that, right? So, um, so we just want to, to believe what, uh, what uh, is, is being told is good because now we can, we can uh, distance ourselves. So we can put the blame to somebody else for our uh, unsuccessful life. And this is mm -hmm. comfortable for us. And this is not liberal, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not conservative, yeah. so it is like illiberal. Yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. and as as we said, we this is interesting because um, we learn it. And the history we learn it in school, right? Uh, literature we learn it in school, right? And then now when we were like talking about us with Agnieszka, like why did the people elect them in fourteen? And mm -hmm. we were like started to to talk about yeah because in the history and then we recalled what we learned and everything has been written about us in in those works in the history uh, book um the textbooks for for students in the 20th century that is research on that how they describe the hungarian nation the soul our emotions and then we have literature and we have these narrative psychological studies which like pushed us to the direction to believe that, yeah, we have to look at the value studies and there are value studies saying the same thing, that we are yeah. in this I, term different, sorry. Yeah, I want, yeah, yeah, to, to thank you, to give just the floor a few minutes to Anishka and then just give the floor to uh, Jana for, uh, Jana for the last question. Yeah, I think that I think that Dima said almost everything. I would like to also add that we use this, uh, um, uh, word illiberal uh, to, um, to, to, to show the direction of the changes. It is not for better, but for worse from this uh, ideal point of uh, constitutional um, uh, democracy or liberal constitutionalism. And as we uh, said during our speech, we need more uh, research on the value orientation to, to, uh, to get more knowledge how it is uh, 
uh, based. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. And so we had the, the last question by Jana about, uh, yeah, <laughs> would you like to ask Hi. you very briefly? Uh, yeah. It's kind of, it's it's been a very interesting session, partly because because I belong to a very different generation from yours. And I belong to a generation which actually saw a great deal of civil society in Eastern Europe. Uh, if it hadn't been for the civil society in Eastern Europe, which challenged what seemed to be an impossible thing to challenge quite often, whether we're talking about ministries of education, ministry of law, parliament, and so on. What is it, do you think, that has changed the situation so radically? I could argue in very simple terms, and by the way, this is not entirely serious, but you could argue that in a way the economic change has been fundamental in the sense that in my generation, people could pretend to work, but they didn't have to. Nowadays, to be able to have the time to think about organizing any kind of opposition, any kind of thought, any kind of anything is so much more difficult. Do you think there's some truth in that? That's my yeah, question. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> we had, here are two of us, and uh, yes, it is um, uh, more difficult, I think, because of this uh, that we have to put more effort in uh, different uh, um, uh, spheres of uh, our lives. But I think also that we have to uh, study the transition period because it is true what you said that uh, uh, the changes. Uh, in 80s were, or even at the end of, uh, yes, in 80s were uh, driven by a civil society, which uh, had unfortunate environment to develop, but it developed, yes. So uh, I believe in people, that people has uh, this, uh, uh, this power to change, but I think also what is a great obstacle for, for us, for our society, is that uh, the value orientation, what was uh, very important at the beginning of transition, what was not translated to, uh, to the society. And now it is uh, a, a kind of consequence of, of that. Yeah, so Tima, I am sure that you want to add something. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, the transition, yeah, everything will be fine, will be nice, we will belong to the West, we will earn as much money as they earn in Austria. And it didn't happen. And, uh, and that, is, that is it. And we have this unbalanced uh, identity. So when somebody is saying that the other government bankrupted the state uh, and then we will um, we will um, we'll, um, remedy it and everybody votes for them. Yeah, so that is true in, in this uh, economic changes, yes. Yeah, well, great. That was the, yeah, a, a great part of the, the discussion. It's already time for us to conclude. So I wanted to thank you all of you for being with us today. And, and thanks Agnieszka and Timea for their great presentation. Congratulate them again for the book. And we are waiting for the, the next book then. <laughs> the, the, the one that will be looking at this really key question of, of uh, uh, undoing. Thank you again. That was a terrific discussion. And we hope we will uh, see you for one of our uh, forthcoming seminar. Thank you, everybody. And, and wishing Thank all the you. best to all of you. Yeah.